All right, let's get started. Once again, I want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Will Penfield, and on behalf of Everbridge, I'm excited to present this webinar, Communicating with Employees During a Terrorist Attack. During the event, Andrew Woods will discuss best practices around using emergency notifications to ensure employee safety during a terrorist attack. After Andrew's presentation, Claudia Dent will present Safety Connection by Everbridge and show you, show you how we can leverage location data to quickly find and communicate with employees during critical events. After the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session with our speakers. We encourage everyone to participate and ask questions during the webinar. You can submit your questions by typing in the questions widget and submitting to all panelists. Link to the slides and recording of the webinar will be sent out to all registrants by the end of the week. You can also look for recordings to all of our webinars on everbridge.com under our resources section. And now I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Andrew Woods is the Managing Director at Resiliency Matters. Uh, Andrew has worked in the business continuity field since 2004 and has built ISO and BTI aligned resiliency programs from the ground up. Andrew is also a member of the Business Continuity Institute. After Andrew, we will hear from Claudia Dent. Claudia is the Vice President of Product Management and Product Marketing here at Everbridge. Claudia has many years of experience in the technology industry and has held executive positions in product management, marketing, business development, and general management at companies ranging from startups to large global enterprises. And now, without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Andrew. Andrew, you may begin. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Everbridge to offer me the uh, opportunity to speak to you all um, from sunny England, uh, as it's a beautiful day right now. Um, as William kindly introduced me, um, I'd like to say that uh, I have worked in the business continuity field since 2004. And I have, uh, some would say I have been lucky enough and some would say that I have been unlucky enough to have activated my crisis management and business continuity plans multiple times. Um, I have also managed large programs globally um, and had the opportunity to roll out mass communication products to over 150,000 employees covering hundreds of lines of businesses from hedge funds, um, and trading platforms all the way through to manufacturing plants and shipping. When I say shipping, I mean ocean-going liners. Um, over 67 different countries, uh, which is a really great challenge because if I translated into 20 different languages, I only got around 80% uh, 80 of the languages spoken globally. So without further delay, I'd like to move forward into our main topic today, which is communicated communicating with employees during a terrorist attack. So I need to talk about the elephant in the room today, which is the very sad and tragic events coming out of Brussels today. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, there was a significant terrorist attack this morning, which has just recently been claimed by ISIS. Uh, they are now confirming that they coordinated and uh, undertook this attack, which has resulted in 34 people losing their lives and over 150 people receiving um, life-threatening through to minor walking, uh, walking wounded wounds. Um, obviously my heart goes out to those people that have been affected and myself and the Everbridge team, we did discuss whether we should continue to do this presentation or not and we decided that um, we would not let these attacks uh, change our plans and we would keep calm and carry on. So I hope you appreciate um, the fact that we obviously will be dealing with some very, very sensitive subjects today um, and that we, I do this with the greatest of respect in that uh, we hope that what we will learn here today will help us um, recover our organizations and people faster and more effectively in the future. So we should carry on into the main part of the presentation where we have a frighteningly similar event taking place in, in, in Paris, uh, the City of Love. Now, the mode of the attack was different in that the primary method was active shooters rather than um, uh, victim-operated devices like in Brussels. But really, what we're looking at here is a significant change in 
the method of attacks in westernized countries where we have um, in the past seen typically bombings um, on on travel networks such as the 77 bombings in London um, moving forward into what we're seeing now where we're seeing um, ISIS specifically target civilians at their weakest and um, you can't really get much weaker than people enjoying a meal with their loved ones or going to a music concert in the evening and whilst we could spend time talking around the security aspects uh, of what occurred in Paris on that dreadful evening what we're going to be talking about today is the media and how that can shape your response and really thinking about what you need to do in an organization to be if not ahead of the media but right on their coattails making sure that you communicate the right message to the right people at the right time now where I want to start this conversation is around the media and what what that really means in this day and age and what you're seeing here in front of you right now is a screenshot a still before I go any further, I will not be showing this video, I can assure you I will not be showing you this video, um, of the events that took place outside the fire, fire exit of the Bataclan Theatre in Paris. And why is this significant? Well, it's significant because this is a screen grab of live, uncensored footage that was broadcast onto social and television media with no delay and no involvement from any editor. Now, this is significant because prior to this event, there is a rule in the media in Europe that would say anybody that showed the deceased or dying moments of a Western citizen, of a British citizen, an American citizen, of a French, German citizen would never work in the media again. But that happened here. Furthermore, the other significant factor that took place was that within the European Union there are very con there are very tight privacy controls and restrictions around reporting and those privacy tro controls and restrictions were in fact lifted and they are still lifted the French government has extended the state of emergency effectively meaning that those rights that you take no longer exist and this is very, very interesting because this is something that the, the French take incredibly seriously. That right to privacy, that right to anonymity has been waived during this attack. Now, that affects, and that's a very important people be, uh, piece because that affects how we can use data, which we will come back to. Secondly, during the Paris terror attack, Facebook rolled out their social good program and this wasn't the first time that they rolled out their social good pro uh, program uh, the first time was the Nepal earthquakes now the social program for those of you that aren't aware is an app that the Facebook team push and what it does is it says we think that you're in this area are you okay and what we'll do is once you check in and say are you okay it will actually notify your friends and your, your friends network. Now, what better illustration than to look at my Facebook page from today, from this morning, where I can see two of my friends, and these are my friends, who have checked in and said that they are safe. Now, on the evening of the Paris attacks, again, this was highlighted very, very well because I had friends who were just a block away from the Bataclan when the attack took place and they were again able to use Facebook to say I'm here and I'm okay now thirdly you have social media as well social media is a very powerful tool it can be used for good and it can be used for ill and in front of you what you're seeing right now are two really great examples of social media of Twitter being used for good with Porto Ver and Porto Ver was the hashtag that was used to inform people that were stuck in the city of Paris because the networks were shut down that their sofa, their spare room, their couch is open. You can come and stay in my house, stay in my flat, my apartment, because you've been stand you've been stranded and I want to help you. 
other agencies also use Twitter for wonderful purposes, including hospitals, urgently requesting people of certain blood types to, res to, to go to their go to their local hospital and give blood so they could save lives. And it worked so well that there were queues coming out of the door and they actually had to follow up and say, please stop coming. We've got enough people. Thank you so much. But like everything with social media, it's a double edged sword. And there were those that used social media for ill with the hashtag Paris is burning. And there were some very disturbing images and tweets that were posted out there by supporters of ISIS glorifying the actions of the terrorists and in fact even non-ISIS supporters decided to use the terrorist attack in Paris against individuals they did not like a great example would be where an individual had his picture stolen from his Facebook page photoshopped and then spread to social media saying this individual is one of the terrorists. This was retweeted thousands of times, picked up by the media in both the United States and in the United Kingdom, and this individual's details were broadcast. Of course, that individual had nothing to do with the terrorist attacks, and it was purely there to defame him. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, this shapes the way that we respond to our leadership and to our people during a terrorist attack because a lot of times I will actually have people come to me and say well you know what we're just going to use social media we're going to use Facebook and we're going to use Twitter to control an incident but really what happens when your leadership comes to you and said Andrew I need you to contact all of our people in the area that's been affected and report back to me on the status yeah how are these people? At that point, can you rely on social media? Can you rely on Facebook? Now, personally, I don't have any of my colleagues on my Facebook profile. Really, are they interested in what I thought of the last night's Walking Dead episode? Probably not. You know, it's for friends and family. I don't have a Twitter account. And really, having those sources available to your organization is useful but it's not in your control. It can be hijacked and people cannot share their information. So how do you really need to make sure that you're getting the right message to the right person at the right time? Well, that's the first thing you need to do is you need to think about what is an acceptable response rate during a major incident. So if you're going out and you're standing in front of your sea level and you're saying to them, we can get hold of 70% of our employees within an hour, is that acceptable? I would suggest that probably it's acceptable in some circumstances, but it's not ideal. The higher, the better. And certainly from personal experience, I have found that if you're able to respond with 90 or 95%, because you'll never get 100 very quickly, that is certainly a much better way of doing things. And then secondly, what are the best ways to communicate with people? Obviously, we've just talked about social media we've just talked about Facebook and Twitter well really what we need to think about is well, what happens during a terrorist incident well we can to put it bluntly we cannot rely on a single notification path now a great example is there was a shootout recently in Australia during the shootout the 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 the, the biker gang that were involved actually used social media and used things like Twitter and Facebook to understand where the police were and where they were responding to. So, they, so the local authorities shut it down. You may also find scenarios where, like today in, uh, in Brussels, the GSM, the mobile phone networks, became so busy that they clogged and stopped working. So you could not rely on SMS, you could not rely on phone calls. But the local internet provider in the airport actually opened up their network completely free. So everybody had wireless. So straight away, what you start to look at is you've got to rely on a system whereby you can contact people using multiple paths, regardless of the day or night, regardless of the time, regardless of where they are. If you think somebody is in the, uh, the impacted area, you need to be able to contact them 
in multiple, multiple different ways. Now, it's all very good and well me saying that, but let's give you an example. Let's really show you where the rubber hits the road. Now, I'm going to give you an example here, just for some as some food for thought. So we have a scenario where something happens at 9 p.m. on a Friday evening. Around 500 people need to be contacted. We've got two. We've got two different notifications that are going to be sent here. One via SMS, where they will uh, request a response, but the users have never been trained. The system has never been actively pursued. The other person is going to use five plus channels. They're going to use mobile phone, SMS, mobile app, landline, email, personal email. There's many different paths that they're going to use. They're going to request a response, but they're not actually just going to ask, are you okay? Yes, no. They're actually going to ask a meaningful response, get a, a real response from the individual. And the user is drilled on the system. So what does that mean? That means that the person is used to responding. And that's a very important piece. And the reason that it's important is because that was an actual scenario that occurred in Paris. And these are the results, these are the core results that those different clients received. Now, having been a business continuity manager in the past and having had to report life safety issues up to people after significant events, I can certainly tell you that I would not want to be the person who says that they can only get 9% of their people responding within two hours. That would be a very, very uncomfortable situation. And the only reason that these people have been able to get that kind of response is because they are following some simple keys to success. So first of all, they're preparing, and that's really important, understanding what is an acceptable response rate to your organization. And that's really about having a conversation with your C team, C level team, CEO, CIO, CFO, CRO, whoever those guys are, and really getting them to understand how seriously do we want to take this? Okay, how, you know, in the event that there is a terrorist attack, there is a San Bernardino, there is another Paris, there is a 7-7, the bombing on, a, on, on the tube, or it could be a natural disaster. What do we really want to have? Why do we, why do we need that response rate to be high? Well, I'll tell you. Very simply put, the time and effort that you spend recovering from an incident and looking after your employees' welfare needs to be spent on those that need it, not those that can't be bothered to respond. So that's why you need that response rate to be as high as possible. And that goes into, well, what contact paths will you use? And that's really important because your leadership can help drive what contact paths are available because if they are successful in communicating why this is important, why we need that response rate, then we can start talking about well, actually, yeah, I don't mind having my personal contact details in a notification system because I understand that this is important because we know that in the event of a terrorist incident, we need to be contactable. And then are your contacts up to date? Because it's all very well saying, yeah, I'm happy to have every single number under the sun and contact path under the sun. But if that information is out of date, well, that's no good. So it's about making sure that you've got a process in place that not only means that you're going to get the response rate that you want, but also builds on making sure you've got the path and the data to do that. And that comes on to education. Do you, simply put, do your employees know how to respond? Now, I get probably 15 spam calls a week, random numbers phoning me up trying to sell me things not particularly helpful. So I immediately, I look at that number and I swipe left, not interested. Now, if you suddenly have your employee getting a random call from a system or an email that says there's been an emergency, they probably are not going to respond. And I would say that this is one of the most significant factors in having a low response rate. Maybe you've trained your users to, to spot phishing emails so well that they won't click on that link because they think that they're going to get a virus 
And I've certainly seen that. So really making sure that your users know that when that number, whatever that number is you choose, flashes up on your phone, and it is down to your decision to have that number, that they will know that it's coming from you, that they know how to respond. And that knowing how to respond brings you to having templates and putting your organization's branding when you're sending out a message. So the top line, the first thing you should have in your notification is your organization name, who you are. Simply put, this is company, you know, this is emergency notification from company X. So important to ensure that that is the first thing that people hear. And then, and then the last point is making sure that you can report on those results. Really being able to pull together an executive report based on who's responded and when, so that you can present that to your organization. So you've got your employees knowing how to respond, you've got your templates with your phone numbers, your corporate branding all in there, and you've got your, you've got your report ready to go, having that ready to go, brilliant. So now what have you got to do? You've got to test it. You've got to demonstrate your system works, not at the time when all heck is breaking loose around you. You need to basically make sure that you can test your system in a scenario that's going to be realistic, but not too realistic, where people are going to be asked to respond the way they would be asked to respond in a real event. And that's really important to make sure that those people understand how they're going to be communicated to and what's expected to the, of them. And it may be that all part of this, all of this needs for you to build a crisis response framework and policy that you need to stand up within your organization and have your senior leadership sign off on and say, we make a pledge that we will respond in X amount of time, in one hour, two hours, four hours, whatever that is for your organization and then to drill and to test around that SLA, around that service level. Because you need to make sure that if you say you want to have 85% of all of your people respond in an event, that you can meet that. Because it may be that that last 15% 15 is the one that you need to be spending your resource on, tracking them down. And then from from that response you need to understand what do you need to do to enhance and improve one of the biggest questions i get is well we had a really great success rate we had a really great exercise we told everyone there was going to be a notification tomorrow we sent the notification and everyone 100 percent of people responded great fantastic big thumbs up high fives all around but now let's do it at seven o'clock on a friday evening when nobody's expecting it and see what happens and you may be surprised with the results that you get. Really is very, very eye-opening. And really what I hope here is I've given you a really high level, a real taster of some of the things you can do to try and help you prepare, educate your people, to manage a terrorist incident, to make sure that you don't rely on the social media and that you really can look at ways to make sure that you are responding in a timely fashion and so that you can ensure that if there are people caught up in a scenario that they can get the resources and the help that they need so thank you very much i hope you found that enjoyable hey andrew thank you very much um really appreciate that um you know, really a pragmatic look at um, how to manage these kinds of uh, notifications um, because uh, it's it's incredibly helpful to have that experience uh, and to and understand exactly what's going to happen, et cetera. Um, what I wanted to do in our remaining time is just take you through some new enhancements that we've made to our mass notification product with a new module called Safety Connection. And a lot of the features that you're going to see in Safety Connection um, were actually, um, you know, uh, um, honed and and really built for things like the Paris situation. And um, it's so unfortunate that we're here today, you know, facing another one of these um, tragic events. 
But the whole challenge that we found that many of our customers have is that if you have highly distributed teams and teams that are um, you know, traveling a lot, it's really hard to understand exactly where everyone is. With the Everbridge system today and mass notification as it is, you have a great record of where someone might possibly be because you can um, have a very rich profile around their home address, their home office, maybe even a secondary office location, et cetera. But you may not have a good understanding of where people are from a travel perspective. So our goal is to um, help you solve the problem of being able to quickly communicate to impacted employees under any range of, of events, whether those events be natural or terrorist attacks, um, you know, in a highly you know, distributed traveling type employee environment. And the way that we do this is we leverage really location-based alerting for security and incident response. Um, we know that the more information we have about a particular contact, the more accurate we can place their whereabouts, the, more, the higher probability we have of accuracy. Um, so for example, you know, a very incredibly highly accurate source is being able to leverage mobile awareness and someone's geolocation. So that's, that's a great piece of information. But sometimes people turn their location services off. So even in light of being able to have this kind of capability, um, it's not too useful if someone has turned their location services off. So there are other sources of information that you can leverage to get an understanding of where people are. For example, there are a number of access awareness um, capabilities where you can look at network access points. Where are people logged into the network, whether that's from a Wi-Fi perspective or from an Ethernet perspective, you can understand and get a layout of where people actually are and that they're actually in the building on a particular floor, in a particular area of that floor, um, which can be particularly helpful in active shooting situations, et cetera, to understand where people are in a building. And also, have they actually badged into the building? So the whole idea here is to have a connection to your um, security access control system and have a profile of actually who's um, logged into the, you know, actually, you know, uh, badged in and who's uh, in a particular building. And then there are other things as well. What, you know, from an employee perspective, what are their travel reservations saying? Were they supposed to land in Brussels at any point in time? Which one of your employees? is in Paris or Brussels, et cetera. Um, being able to just easily access that information from the travel system would be really you know, advantageous. And then finally, things like room scheduling software, like Dean Evans, on-call schedules, et cetera. These also paint a picture of where people are um, at any given point in time or where they are expected to be. So what we have done in um, the Everbridge system with Safety Connection is built the ability for you to connect to these various different systems and have a very rich profile on where people actually are or where they're expected to be. So in light of a situation like the Paris attacks, et cetera, you're able to more easily reach people who may be impacted. Um, and these are um, the new dynamic location connections and connectors. So for example, from a last known location perspective, being able to integrate with your network access system. We have a new connector that enables you to, uh, to provide that integration on a regular basis back to your employee's profile in Everbridge. Where have they accessed the badge system? That's another set of connectors that we have um, that can populate an employee's profile of where they last badged in. Likewise, where are they in regards to traveling? Um, you know, what airport have they, you know, are they expected to have landed at? So all of this information, and you can see from, you know, this is Diane Wilkinson's profile, um, enables you to get an understanding of where Diane is, um, you know, is located at any given point in time. So not only do you have 
those static addresses, you know, and all the other information in Diane's profile, but now you have the ability to understand from a dynamic perspective where Diane might be. Now the interesting thing here is also is that the nice thing about leveraging Everbridge and the Everbridge contact system is that this is one place where you can go for um, integrating many different systems. So for example, if you're an international company, you may have different badging systems. Um, so why not have one point of reference that really aggregates all of this data from access control systems, network systems, and, uh, and travel systems under one um, contact profile. That way, at any instant in time, you have the most complete information about the whereabouts for employees for safety purposes. So um, let's take a look at how that surfaces in the Everbridge universe. Um, we have a set of new map icons so that if you uh, want to associate um, employees with um, specific you know, assets that are part of your locations like R&D centers, data centers, branch offices, manufacturing facilities, et cetera, you can assign um, unique icons to those facilities and have them all loaded within the system uh, associated with these unique icons. Um, and you can also locate other um, things like airports, et cetera, so that uh, you know, you'll, you'll understand where people are from a travel perspective, and that will be automatically you know, tied in. So once you have um, an understanding of all key assets in your organization and where people might possibly be, and you connect that with the dynamic profile, you're able to, at any point in time, locate people and say, OK, um, for this particular building, there are 33 people who are last known to be in this building based on either network access or badge access control. And there are 56 people who claim this as their home office. So this gives you, you know, an instant way to reach out to these various people, and it also enables you to create a mustering list um, in the event of, you know, some kind of attack, et cetera, so you can, you know, decide how you're going to you know, reach out. You're going to reach out to those 33 people first, and then maybe all 56 people as a follow-on, both in parallel. That is completely up to you how you want to do that messaging. Um, but the point here is that you, know, you have an instant um, access to this mustering list um, for reaching out to um, employees. Likewise, um, you can also easily figure out how many employees for example, are traveling. Um, so, um, you know, at this point in time, by just looking at the airport in France, you can see that 30 of your employees were expected to be at Charles de Gaulle Airport at this particular given point in time. So you know you have 30 people that could have been possibly impacted by the Paris attacks. And you can reach out to those uh, people instantly from the Everbridge um, uh, portal and get an understanding of whether or not they're OK, et cetera. Um, also as part of Safety Connection, we're introducing some new safety capabilities from a mobile perspective. And these are standalone today, but they're going to be integrated into Contact Bridge in the summer of 2016. But this is where employees can proactively reach out to you if they're in a panic situation or if they're in a situation that you know, they're, they feel unsafe. But there's some uh, cool underlying features with this panic button. So first of all, when you activate the panic mode, you have nine seconds to cancel it, or 10 seconds actually, it's counting down, um, to, to cancel it if you hit the panic button by an accident. If you didn't hit it by an accident, you can click on panic now, and it will you know, go immediately to panic. If by chance someone holds a gun to your head and says, hey, cancel that panic, you have a special code that you can enter that will enable you to continue the panic without that person knowing. Um, so that's the secret panic capability, which is super important in certain you know, uh, situations where you know, you're being assaulted, et cetera. In addition to the immediate panic, there's also a new capability called the safe corridor. And this is very valuable for uh, employees who may, you know, think that they're entering into an unsafe area, so they set up what's, 
what's called a safe corridor, and they have to check in at specific intervals of time, which can be you know, pre-programmed into the system. So for example, if I'm going to walk across Central Park in the middle of the night, I might want to set up a safe corridor. And where you see the, um, the blue dots, that's where I have checked in officially. So every um, few minutes, I'm required to check in per the safe corridor. And I enter my code, and I successfully check in. If at any point in time I fail to check in, the system will automatically go into panic mode. Um, and when it goes into panic mode, you can see that um, it actually starts reporting information much more rapidly to the Everbridge portal. And you have an understanding of um, where people are you know, possibly being dragged to, et cetera, if this, that phone is still with them. It also kicks off the ability to take a video of what's happening while you're in panic mode. So that will give you know, more evidence as to actually what's happening. And you can see that that data is being transmitted on a much more frequent basis during this panic situation. Um, in addition to that, once you, the employee has entered into panic mode, you have the ability behind the scenes to decide you know, how you want to set up your communication workflow in the event of a panic. Who gets notified? Are there on-call people who have to respond? Do you want to escalate to certain um, members of your uh, response teams, et cetera? All of this can be automated you know, leveraging the Everbridge communications system. Um, so, um, safe, you know, safety connection it really is meant as a set of capabilities that enable you to really provide better information on where people are, more specifically from a dynamic perspective, and also provides the ability for the employees to activate a panic mode um, when you know they feel like they're in trouble or in danger. Uh, so. Um, you know, the, the whole point here is to provide a higher level of um, security and incident response, you know, leveraging all of the abilities of the Everbridge notification system um, to expand your duty of care for your traveling employees, to automate evacuation processes, and improve operational responses. So, you know, from an Everbridge perspective, we continue to invest in, you know, taking our capabilities and making them even more automated for these kinds of you know, unsafe emergency situations like you know, terrorist attacks. Um, so as many of you know, um, Everbridge is a global organization. We have over 18 global offices and data centers. Um, you know, this is the 11th year that we've been a market leader. Um, we're a highly scalable system. We send over a billion messages per year. We have 100 million contacts managed. Um, so just to give you a, you know, a, a sense of the scale of Everbridge and how we can serve, truly serve, um, our global customers. Um, and, you know, and with that, I just want to show you the kinds of customers that we serve across many, many markets. Um, you know, obviously, you know, corporate finance, health companies, and biotech, government, transportation are all uh, major customers of ours. Um, and, uh, you know, in my mind, the customers you know, speak, speak for themselves you know, more than Everbridge you know, can possibly um, relate to you the many, the many benefits. Um, so with that, I, uh, I want to thank everyone for um, joining our um, webinar today and again you know, extend our, our sorrow about um, the uh, events in Brussels. And I'll turn it over to, um, to Will to take us through the Q&A session. All right. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, we are going to move on to our Q&A session. Uh, as a reminder, you can submit your questions by typing a question into the open text field in the questions panel on your screen. The uh, first question we have is probably a good one for you, Andrew. Uh, what sort of reporting structure should you have with leadership when someone doesn't respond? Okay, that's a great question, and this will uh, vary slightly from organization to organization depending on um, your size and your overall, you know, your overall structure. Um, 
typically uh, what I've seen work successfully in the past is to have um, a very, very direct line straight to um, your senior leadership if you suspect somebody is uh, either missing or in trouble in a scenario such as a terrorist attack or uh, a lost life incident. Um, the reason that you would do this and perhaps you would actually um, escalate outside of normal normal paths is because you have a duty of care uh, or you would often have the duty of care that you want to get that resolved as quickly as possible and if you need to start involving emergency services you may also wish to start thinking about things like will you need a press brief will you need to get your um, communications team involved will you need to get your legal team involved what are you going to do about those em the employees who work with the person who is missing or potentially hurt what kind of employee support and services will they need so really when you have these situations the sooner you can get this up to your board level up to your C level the quicker now it's much easier to say okay stand down we found the person you know a few hours later than to sort of be sat there going well we've been caught with our our trousers around our ankles and we're not prepared um, so certainly my experience of the situation is really around making sure that you can get the information to the people as quickly as possible who are in the senior enough positions to make those calls. All right, thank you, Andrew. Uh, next question we have is, does safety connection work if there are multiple offices with different badging systems? Did you say Andrew? Oh, sorry. I'll repeat the question here. It says, does safety connection work if there are multiple offices with different badging systems? Uh, yes. The answer to that question is um, that's one of the advantages of safety connection is that you can integrate multiple badging systems. So under one, um, you know, contact database, you can uh, represent, you know, the dynamic locations across your company and across those various different badging systems. All right. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, this next question is. How often do you recommend sending messages to staff during these types of incidents? And how often should you check in to ensure they're safe? Okay, now that's a really great question. Um, so again, this is a little bit around your command and control structure that you should have in place for dealing with incidents. Um, if So if you have people who are directly involved um, with the incident, either at the location or um, who are uh, affect, you know have colleagues and friends affected it's better to communicate more frequently um, and for general updates it's better to communicate a couple of times a day now I deliberately haven't put any timing in there because the important thing to do is to set the expectation around when you will be communicating so for example um, this morning when I launched the initial um, notification for the, uh, the, the the bombings, the terror attacks in Brussels, I set an expectation there that I would be reporting to my clients every hour on the hour. Now, for the rest of the organisation, and that was just the, the, the leadership, for the rest of the organisation, I told them I would be reporting three times a day, once in the morning, once at midday, and once at um, close of business, because they weren't directly um, impacted and it was an inform now I would say the important part there is to a make sure that your initial communication comes out as quickly as possible um, and it's better to communicate and send a safety check and then think oh you know perhaps we couldn't have done we shouldn't have done that than to not and then when you decide that this is an incident that you do need to manage is to set an expectation around when you will communicate in your initial communication and then really stick to it and make sure that you are sending out those notifications and you know there's nothing to say that if you have nothing to report at a particular hour you can send a communication out that simply says there are no updates at this time and I've sent a lot of those in my in my life um, but it's just important that people know this is that the incident is still ongoing, that it is still being managed, and how they need to progress if they have any questions or queries. Thank you. 
All right, thank you, Andrew. Uh, just another one just came in for you. Is how often do you suggest testing these types of systems to prepare for terrorist attacks and other emergencies? Uh, that is a great question. Um, it really depends around uh, your type of organization and what your risk profile is. So a big client that I'm working with at the moment is a high street retailer um, who, believe it or not, is a uh, high risk client through uh, acts of criminality and being on the high street terrorism. Um, and they they are choosing to do company-wide tests every quarter and then store-wide tests every month and they're deciding to have a reporting system where that's actually reported um, on their security dashboard so they're actually asking their store managers of which they have hundreds you need to do a test every month because you have a high staff turnover at your location so therefore we need to know that people understand how to respond and then at a much wider level, they're doing the big crisis management test once every quarter um, in a very, very structured and controlled way. Um, other organizations who have a lower risk profile um, choose to do them seasonally or even some organizations choose once a year. I um, am not a particular, I'm not a particular fan of that because if you do it once a year, chances are your employees aren't going to know how to respond um, and I've certainly seen that on a number of occasions. All right, thank you Andrew. Our next question we have is uh, for you Claudia. Uh, can you communicate or send alerts to a mobile app with safety connection? Um, and the answer to that question is uh, yes. Um, we have a, a, a application called Contact Bridge um, which in addition to leveraging multi-modalities, which Andrew talked a lot about, which is uh, critically important, um, this is just yet another great path that you can use um, that often works sometimes when other infrastructure doesn't work like SMS, et cetera. All right. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, looks like we have one more question here. It's probably best for you, Andrew. Uh, do you recommend using templates uh, within these notification systems during these types of events? Absolutely, 100%. Um, I would, I would recommend that you have templates created for everything. Two reasons. Um, the first reason is that uh, I can I can speak from personal experience being woken up at three o'clock in the morning by a uh, facility manager saying my facility is on fire. I need you to send a notification or something along those lines. You don't want to be double double guessing yourself, triple guessing yourself around who to communicate, when to communicate, how to set it up, who needs to be included, who needs to be excluded. If you've got all of that templated out, it's very, very simple. Um, secondly, um, secondly, the, the templates allow you to put things like company branding and to ensure that when people receive the messages, certainly on things like um, email they're going to receive a company logo and it's going to look formatted in a uh, in, in an acceptable way and that seems like a very small thing but it is a level of comfort that people tend to appreciate all right thank you Andrew we did just have uh, one final question come in and it's uh, for you Claudia are individuals travel details entered manually into safety connection or is it automatic Absolutely. Um, they are not entered manually. They are entered automatically with a connection to a travel system. So all of the connectors, whether it's to network access points, um, access control systems, and travel systems are accomplished through, um, through automated connectors. And you determine you know, how often you want those updated, you know, uh, whether it's every 10 minutes for a you know, badge or a network system and maybe less frequently for a travel system. All right, thank you, Claudia. And with that, we are going to wrap up here. I want to thank Andrew and Claudia for a great webinar and to all of our attendees who are able to join us today. Uh, as a reminder, you will receive an email with a link to the recording of today's webinar and slides by the end of this week. Uh, if you haven't already, please take a moment to follow us on Twitter at Everbridge and join our group on LinkedIn, Everbridge Incident Management and Emergency Notification Professionals. For those of you interested in requesting a one-on-one -on -one demo of Everbridge or to learn more about Everbridge's safety connection, please visit everbridge.com forward slash request dash demo. Thank you all again for today's session, and we hope to see you online again soon. Have a great day.